good morning, girls. I say good morning not because it's morning while I'm recording this, but because it will be morning by the time you can watch it. Today's video comes to you in four parts. Part one, a message to Hollywood execs. Part two, minor explosions. Part three, a sense of entitlement. And part four, excerpt. Like I said in my last video, The Chronicles of Narnia, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader came out last night at midnight. I haven't had a chance to see it yet, and I'm still really excited, except I'm kind of devastated because I saw a headline that said, Dawn Treader filmmakers had to change the book dramatically and made it a better movie. What? John Green says that you can't ruin a book by its movie, because no matter what you do to the movie, the book will always be great. But I think that they shouldn't even be allowed to call abominations like the Lightning Thief and the Phantom Toolbooth by those names. You know how Hermione wanted to call Hogwarts a history, a revised history of Hogwarts, or a highly biased and selective history of Hogwarts which glosses over the nastier aspects of the school? I think that's what it should be like. Like, a story kind of based on and sort of resembling the Chronicles of Narnia Prince Caspian. This is the story I love. This is the story I was excited to hear was being made into a movie. I'm going to go see it even though the filmmakers practically ripped my heart out, but it's gonna be really hard for me to separate the book from the movie. I have to try really hard to think about the movie as a movie, and it might be really good, but it'll always just be a shadow of what it could have been. It'll always be that great perhaps for me. Sure you've changed it so that more people will see it, and more people will love it, and that really handsome and talented actor who I like a lot gets more screen time and a juicier role, but I would love him and the movie more if he could play the Peter Pevensey who I fell in love with as a child. So, I know that I talk about a lot of the same things here, like Chronicles of Narnia and Harry Potter. One of the reasons that I love fantasy adventure novels so much is because they don't really spend much time in the mundane. They give you a little taste of the mundane, then it's fantasy adventure, then it's a little bit more of a taste of the mundane into the next book. Speaking of the mundane, which is where that segue was going, my mundane life has just become a little bit more interesting because our hot water heater exploded sometime this morning. So we have no hot water in our house. No one was hurt, but it's really useless until like Tuesday, which is horrible. And I know that hot water is a luxury, and I know this, but still I'm thinking, I just need a shower. Just let me wash my face. Now, I've heard and read more than once that our generation is entitled, and I know that by not having hot water and complaining about it, I'm just sort of reinforcing that belief. But there's this really awesome article in the down bar about how uh, our generation is more likely, apparently, to start a nonprofit. And that makes me ask this question Does our so called sense of entitlement make it easier and more natural for us to believe that other people should be entitled to the same things that we have? I'd like it if in 20 years the entire world was that way. It would be pretty cool. And now part four, an excerpt. I'm in the middle of two novels, one I hope to publish someday, one can never ever be published. I'm going to read you a page of the one that can never ever be published. It's the nerd fightery one and I hope you enjoy it. Two sets of tennis shod feet stepped out of the machine. The men were bickering quietly, their long dark coats fluttering around their knees as they walked, shaking loose the ice crystals that had formed on the woolly surfaces and leaving a trail of water droplets in their wake. I'm just saying that the mustache was not at all necessary, the one on the right said, pushing off his hood with his free left hand as his companion did the same and adjusting his glasses. No one could have even kind of recognized you. He shifted the small bundle in his right arm. He and the man beside him strode quickly, but he handled the bundle with immense care. And I'm saying, the other man replied, pushing his own spectacles further up his nose agitatedly and gripping the handle of his briefcase securely, that I was in character. I can't do any accent on a whim, John. He peeled off the mustache, wincing as the adhesive pulled at his skin, and dropped it in a recycler on the way past. I had to practice that freaking Victorian English accent for a week and a half. The mustache helps. Behind the two, the recycler retracted into the stone wall and hummed for a moment, doing whatever it was that made that particular mustache usable again. Yeah, whatever, John grumbled as they rounded a corner. The high ceilings and fluorescent lights made the men look even paler than they were. The blonde came to a stop in front of a small wrought iron table, setting his briefcase on it and spinning the combination lock open. The clasps snapped free and he pushed the lid up, revealing a laptop computer. He opened a panel in the stone wall, removing wires and plugging them into the proper ports, and the computer word to life. John set his bundle down on a padded, concave table opposite the blondes, and stood so that their backs were to each other. He opened his own panel, pulling down a piece of paper and a pen, and quickly writing the necessary information. While his partner preferred computers, John still preferred the older methods. 
Blonde, he mumbled to himself, checking off things on the sheet. 17 pounds. Blue. He capped the pen and extended his arm behind him, holding the paper out. Nothing happened. He shook it once, trying to draw the other man's attention. Nothing. Hank, he said, and waited for a moment. When his only response was the tap-a-tap-tap -tap -tap of the laptop keys, he sighed, half-turning. Hank! Hank started, having been absorbed into the task at hand, and the typing stopped. He looked over his shoulder at John. What? John waved the form at him slightly impatiently. Hank rolled his eyes inside, taking the paper and laying it on top of his keyboard, unclasping the scanner from the top of his screen and setting it to work. Why can't you just type it into the computer? It takes the same amount of time and saves a full two steps. You know how computers and I feel about each other, Hank, John replied, turning back around for a moment to store his pen and close the wall compartment. We like each other, but we're not quite best friends. He turned to face the younger man again, keeping the bundle in his peripheral vision. And two steps? Scanning it in and... Deciphering your penmanship! You call this writing? He asked, almost incredulous, attaching the scanner to the top of his monitor and gesturing to the image on display. This? This is a scribble. John squinted. That clearly says blue. Says you. There was relative silence for a moment, just the two grumbling to themselves and Hank's typing. The last few days had been full of loud discussions and doing their best to be persuasive and finally prevailing, but only after a little sleep and little heat. They were both admittedly in bad humor. That's the first page of it. I didn't complete my tasks, but nobody but Janet set an actual goal for this week, and um, she didn't even set both of the goals. So I'd like to know if we're actually going by those rules before I get challenged for them. I hope you girls have a lovely weekend, and Janet, I will see you online on Tuesday. Oh, one more thing. Are you all doing the P4A? I know Janet is, the Project for Awesome. Um, I am doing it on at least two, maybe three charities. Uh, I hope to see you guys online.